Very good. You need a minute there? Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, as, uh, as you said, my name's Jeff Brown. I work for Pivotal. I work on the Grails development team. So I spend most of my, I'm one of the folks that helps build the, build the Grails framework. And that's what I spend most of my time working on. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon is, uh, I think, one of the coolest features of, uh, of Groovy, and that is uh, its uh, metaprogramming capabilities. Um, so we've got, uh, there, there are really two parts to this talk. The first part that we're about to take on, uh, I'm, I'm going to cover and discuss uh, Groovy's runtime metaprogramming capabilities, so things you can do at runtime with Groovy that relate to metaprogramming. And part two, which will come later, uh, we're going to focus on uh, really interesting and really powerful things that you can do at, uh, at compile time with Groovy, which is uh, really, really interesting stuff. Um, so, uh, so let's just jump right into it. Um, so let's start by kind of uh, uh, agreeing on, on what, uh, what metaprogramming is, or at least the kind of metaprogramming that, that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and metaprogramming is, is one of these uh, words that means different things to different folks in different contexts. Um, the kind of metaprogramming that, uh, that I'm going to talk about is, uh, is changing the behavior of your program at runtime. Um, so it, it turns out in dynamic languages like Groovy, you can do things like uh, add methods to classes while your program is running. Um, you can replace existing methods. You can change the behavior of, uh, of code while, while your application is running. Uh, the behavior of classes can change. And that, that's the kind of metaprogramming that I'm going to talk about. And when we get into this, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see lots of examples and uh, you'll get a sense for why you might want to do that sort of thing. Uh, it turns out that Groovy lends itself really well to that, to that kind of programming. In, in Groovy, uh, by default anyway, there's some things you can do to change this that I'll talk about in part two later. But by default, in Groovy, every method call and uh, every piece of property access uh, that you do uh, goes through Groovy's uh, a, a really dynamic uh, runtime dispatch mechanism in Groovy um, that uh, we often call the MOP or the Meta Object Protocol. So every time you make a method call from Groovy, and, and it doesn't matter if you're calling into Groovy code or if you're calling into Java code, or it doesn't matter what language the thing that you're calling into was written in. Uh, what I'm about to describe is true of every single method call that's made from Groovy. So uh, be clear about that. It doesn't matter if you're calling into Groovy or Java or whatever. If you're making a method call from Groovy or retrieving the value of a property from Groovy, uh, that interaction goes through Groovy's dynamic dispatch mechanism, um, go, goes through the MOP. So with a, with a more static language like Java, when you invoke a method, so, so let's say, let's just use a really simple example. So you create an instance of a string buffer, say SB equals new string buffer, and then you invoke a method on that object reference. So you say, so, say something like SB.append, and you pass a string, right? You're just appending a string to the string buffer object. So you've got an object reference that points to some object on the heap, and you invoke a method on that object reference. With a, a, a more static language like Java, what that means, what the compiler generates instructions for that that says, effectively says, go find the append method in the string buffer class and execute that, right? That's, that's how the dispatch mechanism in Java works in a nutshell. From Groovy, that exact same line of code, when you say sb.append and pass something as an argument, what you're really saying is that you want to send a request to Groovy's dynamic dispatch mechanism and give it some information. So you're giving it uh, an object reference, you're giving it the name of a method that you want to invoke, and maybe some arguments. And Groovy's dynamic dispatch mechanism will decide what to do with that. And one of the things that might happen is Groovy might find the append method that's in the string buffer class and execute it. So the same sort of thing that would happen from, from Java. But there are other things that might happen, right? And we're going to describe how you, can, how you can tap into some of that. But uh, you might want to, anytime someone calls append on a string buffer, you might want to execute your own behavior instead of the default behavior that's provided by the default sh string buffer class. So this, it's this dynamic dispatch mechanism in Groovy that makes, uh, uh, that makes metaprogramming really easy. That's where a lot of the power in, in Groovy comes from, is that dynamic dispatch mechanism allows you to do pretty compelling, uh, interesting things. So here's some code that, that, uh, uh, that demonstrates a little bit of this. So Groovy provides a class called expando, and there, there are uh, uh, lots of reasons you might use an expando object. Uh, they're often used in, in 
uh, in unit tests, but what I want to focus on here is how you can interact w with an expando, not necessarily why you might want to do this, but I want to focus on how it behaves and, and how you might take advantage of that kind of behavior. So the first line of code there is just creating a new instance of the expando class. The second line of code is assigning a value to a property, right? My expando.favorite language equals groovy. Um, we're assigning a value to a property, and specifically, we're assigning a value to a property that does not exist. Uh, so I promise if we looked at the source code for the expando class, that there is no favorite language property in that class. Uh, but that line of code will work, right? We can just assign a value to it, just make up the name of a property and assign a value to it. So that could say my expando.favorite confer conference equals great, and that would work. So you can just make up properties and assign them values. And I want to be clear that what I'm describing is not the way that all groovy objects behave. What I'm describing is how the expando class in particular, how instances of that class behave, and then we're going to explore why that is, how you can write classes that behave that same way. But it's not the case that in Groovy you can do this with any object. So if you write a class called person, one thing you cannot do is something like p equals new person, p dot favorite language equals Groovy. That won't work unless there's a favorite language property in the person class. But somehow the expando class just lets you make up properties and assign them values. And that's what we're going to explore here and figure out how that works. So we'll get back to the favorite language bit in just a moment. Uh, the next line of code says my expando dot add numbers equals Closure, right? The thing on the right-hand side of the equals there is a, is a closure. So the same sort of thing is happening there that's happening with the favorite language line, right? When we say my expando dot favorite language equals groovy, what we're doing is making up a property that didn't exist, favorite language, and assigning it a value. And the value is the string groovy. The next line that says my expando dot add numbers equals closure is doing the same thing, right? We're, we're just making up a property called add numbers and assigning it a value. But this time, the, the value, instead of being a string, is a closure. And when the value that you assign to one of these made up properties is a closure, uh, th there are some interesting things that happen as a result of that. And we'll see that in just a second. So the next line of code says assert groovy equals my expander dot favorite language. That's just asserting that I can retrieve the value of one of these made up properties and it will have the value that I assigned to it. So that assertion does pass, right? So the value of favorite language is the word groovy. The next line of code says my expando dot add numbers 6040. And right? I'm passing two arguments to a method that doesn't exist, add numbers, and somehow I'm getting back a result. Uh, and what's happening when I invoke add numbers there is the closure that's on the right hand side of the equal sign for my expand order dot add numbers equals closure, that closure gets executed, right? We're invoking a method that does not exist and somehow that's, uh, uh, that closure is being executed and we're gonna explore how we get to that point and, uh, and, and develop an understanding of how this works. And then finally, the last line of code there says my expando dot foo equals null. And all that's uh, pointing out is that when you retrieve the value of a property that doesn't exist, you haven't assigned it a value and there is no real property called foo in the expando class. When you do that, instead of getting an exception, like a missing property exception or anything like that, that expression evaluates to null. So my expando dot favorite conference will just be null, right? And I haven't, haven't assigned a value to that property. All right, so that's uh, uh, all the behavior that I just described. Again, that's how the expando class in particular behaves. It's not the case that all groovy objects behave that way. Uh, but we're going to drill into that and figure out how it is that uh, uh, some of that behavior works. So I said before that every time you do property access or invoke methods from Groovy, you're, you're interacting with, indirectly, you're interacting with Groovy's dynamic dispatch mechanism. And here we're going to take a little bit of a look at how some of that works. So when you do something like expando.favorite language equals Groovy, uh, a number of things might happen at runtime when you do that. One of the things that might happen uh, at runtime as a result of that line of code is Groovy might invoke a method called set property on the expando object and pass two arguments, where the first argument is the name of the property that you're assigning a value to, and the second argument is the value that you're assigning to that property. So you would never type code that says expando.set property favorite language comma Groovy but that might be what actually happens at runtime. The, the code you would type is what you see at the top of the slide there, expando.favorite language equals groovy. Uh, when you retrieve the value of a property, uh, some of the same sorts of things might happen, right? So when you retrieve the value of expando.favorite language, one of the things that might happen at runtime is that might result in a call to the getProperty method 
in the expando class, the argument that's passed to get property is the name of the property whose value you're trying to retrieve, and that'll evaluate to whatever value you assign to, to favorite language. In this case, it looks like it's probably gonna be the word groovy. And then finally, uh, at the bottom there, when we call expando.addNumbers, so we're invoking a method that doesn't exist, one of the things that might happen is at runtime, that might invoke a method named invoke method. And I'm gonna write some code here in a minute, and instead of invoke method, we're gonna use a, a different method called method missing. It's, a, it's similar but different than invoke method. But the point is when you invoke a method that doesn't exist, uh, one of the things that might happen is Groovy might call a special method like invoke method or method missing. All of that's gonna make, hopefully, more sense in just a couple minutes when we start writing some code and, and exploring some of that in a little bit more detail. So what I wanna do is uh, we're gonna pretend that the real expando class does not exist, and we're gonna write our own expando. So we'll call it great expando. So I've got a, a really simple test written here that describes uh, one way that we might wanna interact with this uh, great expando object. So I'm creating an instance of the expando class, let me turn on line numbers here. Da, 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 there it is. So on line, uh, line nine, I'm creating a new instance of the great expando class. On line 12, I'm assigning a value to a property that doesn't exist. And on line 15, I'm retrieving the value of that property and asserting that it is what I expect it to be. Uh, if we look at the source code for the great expando class, that's it, right? It's just this empty class. There's nothing interesting there yet. And when I run this test, it should fail. And uh, I realize this font down here is tiny, but that says missing property exception. So when I ran this test, the test failed, and it failed because of this right here, right? So I, I can't just assign a value to a property that doesn't exist on any arbitrary object in Groovy. But what, what, what I can do is add some code to the great expando class that will allow that to work. And that, that's what we're gonna do. If we go back to the slide that we looked at a moment ago, here. The, the code at the top there, expando.favoritelanguage equals Groovy. Um, one of the things that Groovy's gonna do with that is, is it's gonna look to see if there really is a favorite language property in the expando class, um, and there's not. Uh, in, our in our case, Groovy's gonna look to see if there really is a property called town, and there's not, right? So normally what would happen, or by default, what will happen when you try, try to assign a value to a property that does not exist is you'll get a missing property exception, and that's, ex that's what's happening in our test right now. But if there is a set property method in the expando class, instead of, uh, instead of throwing a missing property exception, Groovy will invoke that method. So let's, let's see what that looks like in code. So if I did something like this, like that, that method will be called when I assign a value to a property. So if, if I create an instance of the great expando class and assign a value to a property like this, that method that I just wrote will be invoked. So when I run my test, it's still gonna fail and it's still gonna fail with a missing property exception, but it's failing down here now. It's failing when I try to retrieve the value of the town property. So when I assign a value to a property, Groovy will call this method if it exists, and when I retrieve the value of a property, Groovy will call this method if it exists. All right, so I'm gonna leave both of those empty for now and run the test again. And the test is still gonna fail, but this time it failed with, uh, with an assertion that says these two things are not in fact equal. And again, the font down here is tiny, but what it says is that I expected this value to be St. Louis, and that value is actually null. It's uh, g.town did not throw an exception, but it evaluates to null. So I could put anything at all over here. I could do that, and the test will fail in just the same way, all right? So let's add just a couple of lines of codes to, to our great expando class, and we'll be able to make this test pass. So let's do this. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Let me type one line of code in each of these methods and then we'll, be, we'll have a, a passing test and then we can back up and talk about what's going on here. All right, we'll come back to that momentarily. Let's run our test and we got a green bar. The test passed. And I could keep writing more tests. I could do something like uh, g.conference equals gr8 and down here I can say assert that gr8 is equal to g.conf. We'll run that. 
networks. All right, so let's so review the, the code that I, that I just wrote and uh, make sure that all, all of this makes sense. So on line five, what I've done is I've declared a, a property in this class called dynamic props, and I could have called that anything, right? It's just a protected property that I'm adding to this class. Uh, I called it dynamic properties. This is Groovy syntax, for a literal syntax for creating an empty map, right? So that's gonna be an empty uh, linked hash map by default. So dynamic props is an empty map. Anytime I create an instance of this class and assign a value to a property, this is going to be invoked, right? So when I say g.town equals St. Louis, that this method is invoked, prop name is town and val is St. Louis. And what this line of code is doing is putting an entry in the map where the key is the property name, town, and the value is the value that I uh, assigned to that property, so St. Louis, right? So prop name will be town and val will be St. Louis. So now the map has one entry in it. Then we execute another line of code that says g.conf equals great, and the same thing happens. So prop name will be conf and val will be great. So now the map has two entries in it, right? The keys are town and conf and the values are St. Louis and great. Later, when I retrieve the value of one of those properties, this gets executed, and what this is doing uh, so, uh, is returning the value in the map that is associated with this key, which is the name of the property whose value we're, we're trying to retrieve, like uh, town or conf. Uh, and this is why when I refer to a property that I haven't assigned a value, that it evaluates to null. So if I said, if I uh, tried to retrieve the value of g.foo, uh, that's going to evaluate to null because this is going to evaluate to null. There is no entry in the map whose key is the word foo, right? So with just these three lines of code here, really, we've made, we've satisfied at least some of the behavior, some of the requirements that we talked about in terms of uh, how the expando class is supposed to behave. Uh, so we're going to take this a little bit further here in just a moment, but uh, are there any questions about anything we've looked at so far? Yes, sir. Are you talking about something like that? Um, yeah. Yeah, so if I said town equals Copenhagen, and we go over here and run our test. Sorry, uh, I ask you to repeat the question. Yes, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Uh, so the question is what happens, I think the question is what happens if I interact with a property that does exist, yeah. right? So in our first iteration there, we were uh, referring to properties that did not exist in the expando class, in our great expando class. Now I've got a property that does exist in the expando class, and I've assigned it a value of Copenhagen. Uh, the question is, how is our expando going to behave? And our, our test passed. I just ran the test, and we got a green bar. Uh, what's happening here is any time, so what this is doing right there, that is calling g.setProperty uh, town. St. Louis, right? That's what's happening. So the fact that there's a real town property is of no consequence here. We're calling the set property method. We're not even looking at the real town property. If what you wanted to do was only support this kind of behavior for properties that did not exist, then the way to do that is instead of calling this set property, you can call it property missing. Now that will only be called when you assign a value to a property that does not exist. Right, and the same with uh, get property. If this were property missing, now that method will be called when I retrieve the value of a property that doesn't exist. So depending on what it is you have in mind when you design this class, one of those two behaviors might be what you're after. The way the actual expando works is this, right? So you can't really, you can't retrieve the value of real properties in the expando class because there aren't any that you ever, the, the class is designed in such a way that there's no reason to ever do that. Does that make sense? Good. Other questions before we press on? Yes. Yeah, so if you use at in front of a field name, that's a different thing, right? So if you do this, that is, uh, that's not property access. That's field access. That says go get the value of the town field in the expando class, and none of the stuff we're looking at here factors in there. Right, so we're talking specifically about method invocations and property access. And when I say property access, property access as distinct from field access. Field access is a different thing, right? Anything else before we take this to the next step? Good. All right, let's, let's write another test. 
test, test method invocations. So we'll say, I'll just copy a little bit of code here. Uh, I'll say when g dot add numbers equals x, y, z, x plus y plus z. All right, so yeah. uh, they're on line 26. I'm assigning a value to a property, uh, the property add numbers, and there is no add numbers property, right? I'm assigning a value to the add numbers property, and the value that I'm assigning to that property is a closure, right? This is a closure that accepts three arguments, and it returns the sum of those arguments. That's what it does. Uh, and then on line 29, I'm invoking a method whose name happens to match that property name, Right, so I've got two different things here. I've got a property called add numbers, and then on line 29, I'm invoking a method called add numbers. And somehow, I want those two to be wired up, right? When I do this, I want, when, I, when line 29 executes, I expect that to invoke this closure, right? This is not gonna work, right? We're gonna get a missing method exception, right? Uh, so the first test still passes. We got a green bar up there. The new test uh, threw a missing method exception because there is no method called add numbers in the great expando class, right? If we wrote a method called add numbers in the great expando class, this would invoke it, but that's not what we want to do. We want to do something like this. Uh, let's see, let me type about three lines of code here and then we'll back up, uh, again, we'll back up and kind of review what's going on here and make sure we understand this. All right, we'll come back to that momentarily. Let's run our test and make sure the test passes. And it should, unless I've got a typo there. If I can press the correct keyboard shortcut. There we go, we got a green bar. Both our tests are passing now. So somehow, on when line 29 executes, somehow that's executing the closure that is uh, created on line 26. So let's figure out what's going on there. So what I've just done on line 15 here is I've added a method to the great expando class called method missing. Uh, when you make a, a method call from Groovy, uh, every single method call from Groovy, uh, by default, goes through Groovy's dynamic dispatch mechanism. And uh, one of the things that might happen, if there's a real method in the great expando class called add numbers, that method might be called. There's another way that uh, maybe there's not a real method called add numbers, uh, but in, in just a few minutes, we're gonna see another way we might add a method at runtime called add numbers. Uh, and if that had happened, that method would be executed. But, uh, so there are a number of things that might happen when you invoke a method on an object from Groovy. There might be a real method in the source code, there might be a method that was added at runtime. There are several places that method might have come from. Um, but if all of those fail, if there is no add numbers method and there what, there's not a dynamic add numbers method that we added at runtime, if, if there is no add numbers method that can be found anywhere, normally what will happen is a missing method exception will be thrown. And that's what happened the first time we ran our, this, this test I just wrote. But one of the last things that Groovy's gonna do before throwing a missing, missing method exception is Groovy will look to see if there is a method missing method in this class. And if there is, then instead of throwing method, uh, missing method exception, instead of doing that, Groovy will invoke this method. And now the author of the great expando class gets to do whatever they wanna do, right? What I'm expressing here is anytime someone invokes a method on the great expando class, if that method doesn't exist, I wanna do some special stuff. All right, uh, so that special stuff is what you see starting on line 16. So line 16 is looking into the map to retrieve the value that's associated with method name, right? So method name is the first argument to method missing and that's the name of the method that, that, that was invoked. So in our case, method name will be add numbers, add numbers, right? The second argument is really, it's an array. You don't have to statically type it like this, but it's an array that includes all of the arguments that were passed to the method at invocation time. So if we come back over here, we passed three arguments to the method. So inside of method missing, args is going to be an array that includes three things, right? I'll have 30, 20, and 50, whatever I had in my test there, okay? So when line 16 executes, I'm retrieving the value from the map who, where the key is add numbers. And remember, the value that we assign to add numbers is this closure right here. So when I retrieve that value from the map, the closure is the value that's being 
the, the, is the, that's what prop is. Prop is the closure that we created in our test. Uh, then I've got a, a little check here to make sure that that thing is a closure. Uh, and if it is, I want to execute that closure and pass these arguments into the closure. So, so one thing I could do is something like this. I can say return prop arg sub zero, arg sub one, and arg sub two. And that will work. We'll run our test again just to verify that. We should still have a green bar here. Right? That's going to work. But now we've kind of hard coded this to only work. This expects there to be exactly three arguments, right? If there are more than three arguments, we're going to be ignoring them. And if there are fewer than three arguments, this is going to throw an array index out of bounds exception, right? We don't want to do this. We don't want to sort of hard code the support for a specific number of arguments. Groovy has this uh, uh, asterisk operator, which can be used in a couple different contexts. But in this particular context, when it's applied to a collection or an array, like it is here, what uh, Groovy is going to do with this is it's going to pull out all the individual elements of this thing, right? This object array, and pass each of them as discrete arguments into the closure. Uh, the same would happen if we were invoking a method, but in this case, we happen to be invoking a closure. So it, it's like what, when line 18 executes, it's uh, what's really going to happen is uh, what's shown on line 19. And if args has 20 arguments, uh, line 18 will still work. I'm right? just going to pull all 20 of those arguments out of the array and pass them as individual arguments into the closure. So this is only going to work if you actually pass the correct number of arguments here. Right? So this has to match this. Right? I have to know how many arguments to, to pass in there. But as long as those two are in sync, that this will work. Right? Questions about this business? Does that make sense? Yeah, so what would happen if I tried to do this? Uh, that's probably not a great name for the test, but we'll go with that anyway. So if I did this and said uh, g.town equals Copenhagen, and then I tried to do, um, I don't know even what we would assert, uh, but we'll say town. Something like that. Is, that. is that the question? The question is, what happens if I try to invoke a method whose name corresponds to a property that I assign a value to, but the value is not a closure, right? The value in this case is a string, not a closure. And what's going to happen there is the test is going to fail, but it's going to fail with a comparison. Uh, what do I have? I need this to be equals equals. It's going to fail with a comparison problem, not uh, what we expect it to fail with. And I've got something. Uh, I've got a dot instead of a comma there. There we go. That looks good. All right, so it failed. Uh, G.town 2121 evaluated to null. This evaluated to null. And the reason it evaluated to null is prop is going to be a string here. It's not a closure. So the if check fails. So this just falls through to the bottom here, which is like that. Right? If I, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. If I had this return 42 for some reason, our test is going to pass now because our test is asserting that when I call that, 42 is returned. Let's just run the test and see that pass. It did. Uh, but what's happening when I try to invoke the town method is there is no town method. So this gets executed. This is retrieving the value of town from the map. The value is a string. Uh, so this if check fails. It's not a closure. Uh, so th this falls through, and it's effectively that's happening. right? If I were to skip this check, now we're going to have a different problem. Let's run our test again. And now we've got an exception, missing method exception, no signature of method call on the string class. So what's happening is prop is a string, and we're trying to invoke a string, like you would invoke a method or invoke a closure, and that, that doesn't make sense, right? You can't, can't do that, uh, which is why I added this check here to begin with. Does that make sense? Good. Other questions or comments about this? So we are not using uh, Rob's goal also that missing exception again. I'm sorry, you said uh, in real life something? So if, uh, this was the real expando, this would go the method missing exception? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think the question is if we were writing the real expando class, would we do this? Is that what you're asking? 
so as the designer of the class, we get to decide what to do when someone invokes a method that doesn't exist and we can't find a corresponding method here. Uh, I think the real Expando class does, in fact, do that. Let's see if it jumps out at me here. I don't want to spend, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so the, the real Expando class will throw an exception if, uh, for the scenario that we just described. But again, that, that's, that's a design decision that as the author of this class, we get to make. Yep. Any, any other questions? Let's press on and get to some other fun stuff. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, closure delegates. So in Groovy, every closure, a closure is a block of code, right? A, a closure is, is that it's a block of code. It might accept some arguments and uh, it could return any kind of value. It can, return, it's, it, it can accept arguments and it can return a value and can have arbitrary code inside of it. Uh, so closures have a lot in common with methods, right? A method is a block of code that can accept some arguments and can return a value. Um, closures can do both of those things as well. Um, every closure has a thing associated with it called a delegate. I'm just going to jump forward and start looking at some code here and uh, uh, get right to the interesting bits. So the code at the top there is creating a closure and inside the closure, I'm invoking the append method a couple of times, appending first line, appending last line. And then the last line of code in the top block there is invoking the closure. Uh, and when I do that, we're going to get an exception. And in particular, we're going to get, a, I think, a missing method exception because we're invoking the append method inside the closure, but there is no append method. Right? The, the append is not a keyword in Groovy. It doesn't mean anything special. It's, uh, you could put the word Jeff there and we'd get the exact same results. We're invoking a method that does not exist. So when I execute that closure, we're going to get an exception. The code at the bottom um, rigs things up in such a way that we won't get an exception. So let's uh, want to play with that idea in some real code here. So let me create. Uh, I'll create just a demo.groovy file here. Make sure that's okay, we're in business. All right, so if I said my closure equals All right, if I run this, we're going to get an exception because there is no append method. So the exception that we got down here should be missing method exception, no signature of method append. It's just like I tried to invoke a method with that name, right? There is no such method, so we're going to get a me missing method exception. But if I do something like this, let's say sp equals new string buffer, mc.delegate equals sp. All right, let's run that and see what happens. And what should happen is uh, the value of the string buffer should be one, two. Right? So let's put a new line character in there just so it's a little bit easier to look at. Right? Uh, the value of the string buffer is, is one, two. So somehow this method call, the method call on line two, somehow that method call ended up being directed to this string buffer, which kind of incidentally didn't even exist when this code was written. Right? When, as, the, as Groovy is evaluating this code, the string buffer doesn't even exist. Right? Later, it's created at line six. And really, the interesting bit is line seven. So every closure has a delegate associated with it. And one of the things that the delegate gets to do is the delegate gets an opportunity to respond to method calls. Um, and the same is true for property access. So from this point on, when I, when I talk about method calls, everything I'm about to describe with respect to delegates also applies to property access. So when, when this closure is executed, when it invokes, uh, makes method calls, the delegate gets an opportunity to respond to those method calls. Um, so when line two executes, there is no append method. So normally what would happen, by default what would happen is a missing method exception would be thrown. But before throwing a missing method exception, what, what Groovy will do is Groovy will check the delegate. In this case, the delegate is gonna be the string buffer and say, hey, if someone were to invoke the append method on you and pass a string as an argument, could you deal with that? So this is Groovy interrogating the delegate, which in our case is a string buffer, and saying, can you respond to an append method uh, call? And the string buffer class does, in fact, have a method in it called append that accepts a string argument. So that's what happens, right? So when this closure is executing, um, that call to append uh, 
is really going to end up being invoked on the string buffer, which is why when we print the value of the string buffer at the end of the line here, we see the value is 1 and 2. Those of you who have done uh, Grails development know that uh, you can do something like this. Let me just create a class here. We'll call it person. So in Grails, you can define a domain class with uh, properties like, like that. And then you can declare a uh, property called constraints. And you can say things like um, matches just any regular expression here. Uh, email, email, colon, true. All right, you can do that sort of thing. Those of you who've done Grails development are familiar with this. So this is, this is kind of a DSL for describing um, rules or constraints about what value should be considered val valid for properties in this domain class. So what we're expressing here is that the name property has to be at least five characters and no more than 15 characters, and it has to match this regular expression. Right? It has to begin with an uppercase letter. The email property has to be an email. So just to be clear about this, I'll give these different names. There we go. So the email address property has to be an email address. So there's some regular expression checking there to make sure it looks like an email address. But syntactically what this is, is this is a method call, right? You're invoking a method called name, and we can put the parens here to make it look more like a method call. Uh, we're invoking a method called name and passing a map as an argument where the keys in the map are size and matches and the values are the range and the regular expression. In this case, the map only has one entry, email, and the value is true. Uh, so this closure is invoking methods that don't exist, but somehow that works in the context of your, of your Grails app. And that somehow has to do with this business that we just talked about, right? So note this is all happening inside of a closure. What Grails is doing with this at, at application bootstrap time is Grails looks in your domain class to see if there's this constraints property. And if there is, we grab that closure. So now we've got a, a reference to that closure. And Grails invokes the closure. But if that's all Grails did, this would throw a missing method exception. And this would throw a missing method exception. So before invoking the closure, a delegate is assigned to the closure. And then the closure is executed. That delegate doesn't have a name method in it either, or an email address method, right? The delegate is an instance of some class that we've provided as part of the Grails framework. So we don't know about your property names, right? But that delegate has this in it, right? That delegate has a method missing method in it. So now when your closure executes, you can invoke any method at all inside of your constraints closure, right? Email address is just a made up name, basically. You can invoke any method and that method call is gonna go to the method missing in the delegate, which is an instance of some class that, again, we've provided as part of the framework that you never have to interact with as an application developer. That class has a method missing method in it. And what that method missing is doing is looking at the method name, in this case, email address, and then going out to, uh, say if you're using the Hibernate plugin, we go out to the Hibernate configuration and uh, find the person the, the way that the person class is mapped in, inside of Hibernate and then look for the email address property uh, configuration inside the person class and do some Hibernate stuff, right? Uh, and the same with uh, the name property. So uh, most Grails developers are familiar with writing code like this, but most also don't really understand what's going on in, under the covers, how all that works. And you don't need to understand under the covers how that works. But I think this is a good example to kind of solidify the two ideas that we've talked about here, which is the, the closure delegate business and all of this uh, method and property access interception stuff. Uh, this is a good example of taking advantage of that to create, um, in this case, to create a DSL for describing constraints for your persistent properties. Right. Uh, questions or comments about any of that? It's good, all right, let's press on. Every class from Groovy's perspective has a, um, has a meta class associated with it. So if I were to say, let's just see what name is. Name is going to be a java.lang.string, right? So I said name equals Jake in quotes. Uh, name is an instance of java.lang.string. That, that shouldn't, shouldn't be a surprise. Um, let's say, uh, so let's do this. Do that. Name.getPigLatin. That's going to throw an exception, 
Missing method exception, because there is no method in the string class called get pig Latin, right? And it doesn't, doesn't exist. If we looked at the Java docs for java.lang.string, we'd see no such method exists. But we can do something like this. We can say, I'm sorry? Yeah, I don't know what uh, happened there. Uh, let's see. All right, so we'll get back to that in a moment. But let's run this code. All right, some string here. So this evaluated to some string here. And we can use Groovy's property access business. So instead of calling get pig Latin, we can just refer to the pig Latin property. All right? Inside of this closure, well, well, so let me back up from that a little bit. So every, every class from Groovy's perspective has a meta class associated with it, including classes that are written in Java and including classes that are written in Java that are provided as part of the core JDK. Every single class, every class, no exceptions, has a meta class associated with it. So I can refer to string.meta class, and that's the meta class for java.lang.string. And I can use a syntax that's uh, similar to what we did back here with our expando, right? So I said, uh, let's see, this is a better example down here. Right here, where I said g.addNumbers equals closure. I can use that same kind of syntax over here. I'm saying uh, this is dot add numbers, right? But it's dot get pig Latin. And I'm assigning a closure to that property. Uh, this is one way, this is a really simple way that Groovy provides, uh, one mechanism that Groovy provides that makes it really, really easy for you to add methods to classes at runtime. So here we've added a method called get pig Latin to the string class. Now every single string, every string has a method on it called get pig Latin, and that method does whatever's coded here. So let's do this. Uh, what do I want to do? Du -du -du -du, negative one. Let's run that. We should get Ake J. Ake J is the pig Latin version of Jake, right? Um, so now inside of this closure, I'm referring to delegate. And delegate, remember, every closure has a delegate associated with it. When you use this syntax for adding methods to classes at runtime, um, there are other ways to add methods to classes at runtime, but when you use this particular approach, uh, the, the syntax is class name dot meta class dot some method name. That's the name of the method you're trying to create. Class name dot meta class dot some method name equals closure. And when you use that approach for adding methods to classes at runtime, when this closure executes, the delegate is going to be the thing that the method was invoked on. It's going to be like the this. Uh, it's the thing that the method was invoked on. In, in our case, it's going to be name, which is Jake. So delegate sub uh, one through negative one. Groovy has some kind of nifty uh, uh, collection uh, indexing syntax for doing this sort of stuff. What, what this evaluates to is everything starting at the second character up to and including the last character, right? Zero is the first character, one is the second, two is the third, and so forth. Negative one is the last character, negative two is the second to the last. So one through negative one means everything starting at the second character up to and including the last character. So in our case, it's going to be ake, A-K-E. Delegate sub zero is the first character, so that's J, uh, and then AY is just a literal AY. So we get AKJ. If I change this to Zach, we'll get AXA, right? So now every string, uh, again, every string in our, in our program now has a method called get pig Latin. I can use this technique to add new methods to classes. I can use this technique to replace existing methods. Uh, so be careful when you're doing that. When you uh, replace existing methods, there, there are good reasons to do that. But when you do that, make sure you understand what's going on and don't create uh, a, a confusing environment that's, uh, that's going to be problematic for your application down the road. Uh, but th this approach can be used to add new methods to classes. It can be used to replace existing methods. Uh, I'm not going to write the code to demonstrate how to do this, but there's, uh, with just a little bit more tedious code, what you can do is you can retrieve kind of a handle to an existing method and then add a new method with the same name and then use that handle that you retrieved a moment ago to invoke the real method and then maybe do some other stuff in addition to that, right? So maybe you wanted to do kind of AOP kind of stuff. You want to invoke some logging before and after a method call. Uh, there are probably better ways to do that in Groovy, but you, you could do that using this approach, right? Get a reference to the original method, then create a new method and have the new method uh, maybe interact with the original one in addition to doing some other stuff like logging or whatever it is that you need to do. Does this make sense?
Questions about this? Yeah, so again, this is uh, to, to plug this into the context of, uh, of Grails. Uh, Grails does this all the time, right? There are lots of places in Grails where, where this happens. So if you've built Grails applications, you know that, uh, for example, when you write a domain class uh, like person, so if this were a, a domain class in a Grails app, in a controller or a service or anywhere in your application, you can do something like person dot uh, find all by name. You know, you can do something like that. Uh, and there is no method in the person class called find all by name. So one thing that we might do is we might put a method missing in here, but you don't have to do that, right? When you write your domain classes, you don't have to write a method missing. Somehow this works, and that somehow is a combination of all the stuff that we've talked about, right? Grails is doing this to all of your, it's not doing it to the string class, it's doing it to all of your domain classes. It's adding a method missing, it's actually a static method missing, um, it's adding a method missing to, your, to all of your domain classes and then a bunch of interesting stuff happens in here that has to do with sending queries to the database and so forth. But you, so, so you just, you author your domain class similar to what we've seen here. At runtime, Grails is able to add a method missing to the person class. So now when your application invokes person.findall by name, person.findall by email address, person.findall by name and email address, find all by name in list, all those different combinations of dynamic finders that Grails supports, uh, they're uh, effectively handled with something like this, right? Grails has added a method missing to your class at runtime, and there's a whole lot of complexity inside of here to do all the query stuff, but that's, that's taken care of for you by the framework. Turns out some of what, I, effectively what I just said is, is true. It turns out some of that is not really implemented this way. Some of this is implemented in a, uh, we'll cover some of that in part two. Some of this is happening at compile time. Uh, not dynamic finders in particular, but more static things like person.get. This method is added at compile time, not dynamically at runtime. We'll see how, you, how that's done later. All right. Comments or questions about any of that? All right, one last thing we've got time to look at here. Uh, what do I want to do? Read.xml. Uh, let's see. All right, we'll say football. All right, let's run this and uh, see what happens. Uh, so I just ran that code, and what happened is uh, some markup was created. And by the way, this isn't just creating a string that looks like markup. Uh, real markup uh, DOM element stuff is be being created. Uh, it turns out in, in Groovy, it's really, really simple to create markup. Um, and a way to do that, there are several ways to do it, but one way to do it is to use this markup builder class. And the way the markup builder class works is you create an instance of it, and then write code that looks something like this, right? Just invoke methods that don't exist. Uh, like sports. There is no sports method in the markup builder class, but the markup builder class has a, a method missing method in it, right? So this is going to trigger the method missing method in markup builder, and what that method missing is doing is creating this root element, right? So it creates the sports element and uh, says, okay, we're, we're good to go for now. We've just got this root element and that's all that's happened. The method missing will look at the argument that was passed to the sports method. In this case, it'll see that it's a closure and it'll execute that closure. But before it executes the closure, it has to set a delegate on the closure because the closure is gonna be invoking other methods that don't exist, like baseball and football, right? There is no baseball method, there is no football method. So the delegate that is set on this closure before it's executed is the markup builder, right? The thing that intercepted the, the sports call. So when we invoke the baseball method later, that ends up going to the same method missing that the sports method went to, and the markup builder is keeping track of context and where it's at, and so, so when the baseball element is created, the markup builder knows that it has to add that as a child to the sports element, and then on and on. This can be just arbitrarily deep. But you've got this really simple, slick syntax for creating markup. All the complexity of interacting with uh, uh, JAXP and all the, all, the XML, all the markup stuff, all that complexity is handled by the markup builder. So as the application developer, you do something simple and easy to look at like this. And uh, so, so this, is, uh, this is a DSL for 
uh, for generating markup, right? The markup builder has lots of complexity in it. So as an application developer, you get to do something like this, which has very, very little complexity, and you're taking advantage of all the stuff that's inside the markup builder class. And again, all the stuff that we talked about uh, over the last hour or so all comes together to make that possible, right? Method missing is in markup builder. Closure delegates are used to intercept uh, all these method calls. Um, yeah, it's just uh, really powerful and, and, and flexible stuff provided by the Groovy runtime. Quick comments or questions about that? Good. All right, uh, so, so what I've done, and I'll wrap up here, we've got, we've got like uh, one minute. Um, what I've done is kind of laid the foundation and described a bunch of stuff or described a number of things that, that uh, uh, you can do at runtime with Groovy. And what I'm gonna drill into in part two, which I think is the really, really interesting uh, part of this, is a lot of the same kind of stuff that we're talking about now, uh, some of the same kind of stuff that we're talking about now can be done at compile time uh, as opposed to at, at runtime, and that's what I'm gonna drill into in, in part two. So hopefully some of you will, will hang around for that. Uh, if you've got any questions at all, let me know. I'm happy to talk to you. I'll be around uh, all day today and tomorrow, uh, but, uh, uh, but I think we are out of time, so we'll, we'll call it a break for now and pick up in, uh, when is part two? 10 minutes, 15? At half past. Very good. Thank you all very much.